Hello and welcome back to this Downfall Idealistic Crusade. This video will be a review of Indicator's beautiful Blu-ray release, Their Spine 207, of the extremely important crime and prison drama film, The Criminal Code, directed by the great legend Howard Hawks, starring Walter Houston, Phillips Holmes, and in a smaller supporting role, but an extraordinarily pivotal one, Boris Karloff. This is the film that really is... I mean, this is the film and performance that's responsible for him getting Frankenstein, essentially. And without this, it is very possible that he would not have been uh, selected to play the creature in the original 1931 James Whale Frankenstein. So its importance for horror fans is immense, but it also its importance in Hawks's career and in the early talkies for uh, crime and prison films is, is quite important. And in fact, uh, it was also the subject of a simultaneous Spanish language remake, I guess you should say, that was shot at night, much like the famous Spanish version of Dracula. Unfortunately, that Spanish version is lost. Uh, but it's also been remade twice more uh, under different titles, which some of the extras go over. And in fact, the third version is in one of Indicator's previous Columbia Noir volumes, I believe, Columbia Noir. Noir Volume 3. So the film was released in 1930 and is at a interesting point in Howard Hawks's career. This is after his uh, great early success with the first version of The Dawn Patrol, which is a great classic, and before he would leap to even more stratospheric heights in 1932's Scarface, uh, which also has a nice little part in it for Karloff again. But uh, this fits right in with other crime and prison films of the early talkies, uh, several produced at MGM, like uh, The Big House, for example. It is based on a stage play and has stage play origins, so you will start to recognize where the story is going, and ultimately it will feel somewhat familiar because of that, uh, the sort of origins of being a stage play at this time. But essentially, the, the film's story revolves around the young Phillips Holmes character who is caught and in a, in a barroom brawl where he accidentally kills a man in supposed self-defense. Uh, it is a purely accidental death, but according to the criminal code, the district attorney, played by the great legend Walter Houston, is forced to essentially throw the book at him, and the poor unfortunate boy through different circumstances and not having a very good company lawyer <laughs> winds up in prison on essentially a manslaughter charge and you see how the prison life affects him and starts to eat away at his soul and then essentially it becomes a story of can this boy be saved uh, can he be rehabilitated and can he survive the ordeal and the the title of the film it has a nice double meaning because of course it is the criminal code that put him in prison in the first place but it is the other criminal code the actual code of criminals themselves and shown inside the prison uh, that they live by it's a code of ethics uh, that directly contrasts with the actual legal code so it's a great title and the story gets further convoluted by the fact that after a number of years, the Houston character is made warden of the prison. So I mean, he is reconfronted by uh, this uh, this boy that he helped to put away in prison, even though he himself disagreed with with the uh, with with doing so and uh, bemoans, you know, that he could have gotten him off had he been uh, as the uh, acting as the defense attorney. So it's it's got a great setup and great atmosphere that is further heightened by this being an earlier Howard Hawks film. Uh, you can imagine how this would have been much more straightforward had somebody else handled it. And it also has the distinction of being photographed by two of the greatest Hollywood cinematographers. Uh, it started out being photographed by the legendary James Wong Howe, but unfortunately he was removed from the film and replaced by Ted Tetzlaff, who was one of the uh, screen's other great cameramen. So it has that distinction of being uh, photographed by two of the great cinematographers. I also have to admit the fact that this is a 30s Columbia production. You know, it obviously does look a bit rougher around the edges than say, an MGM production, because at this time, Columbia was still considered to be the uh, on Poverty Row, being the, the lowest end of major studios. 
this would get turned around, particularly by the successes that Frank Capra would have. And you see a lot of the familiar faces that would be in the Capra films. This, of course, predates both Walter Houston and Constance Cummings being in what I think is the first tried-and-true Capra uh, Robert Riskin masterpiece, 1932's American Madness. Uh, and it has some of the same visual quirks of being a early talkie at Columbia. Again, it is a little bit rougher around the edges. You will notice that uh, on 1930s Columbia films as opposed to other studios. Every studio had a house style and a look, but a lot of what you saw at Columbia was because they they had less money. <laughs> they were they were on Poverty Row and it, it kind of gives them a charm, I think, at least. They, it's sort of like the, the, the being a sort of a scrappy up-and-comer in that way, making the best of what you have. So while the, the actual visual quality might be a little bit rougher here and there, uh, that is entirely due to it being a 1930s Columbia film. It's also amazing to see how quickly Howard Hawks was... Uh, finalizing his style, get, working off the rough edges, becoming more and more confident as a director in the sound era. So there's already a big leap over what you see in the Dawn Patrol, but then there's also, it's setting you on the path, and it's, in some ways, it's kind of hard to believe that Howard Hawks is the same director behind The Criminal Code and Scarface, and then made 20th Century in 1934, and then, of course, going on to bringing up Baby and His Girl Friday, and of course, he distinguishes himself as one of the great Western directors in Red River and other classics, uh, and also made, you know, absolute masterpieces in Only Angels Have Wings, and uh, and the big sleep and so many other films that always had a, that, that that a similar sort of flavor a, a, a nice dose of realism but always with a deal of cynicism and occasional bits of humor to uh, make things feel more alive more three-dimensional so if you know if, if anybody could ever be considered a, an auteur hawks would definitely be among those it, it does have his sort of stamp on the film and particularly the the film is improved by the tweaks made to the original stage play uh and especially the ending which was conceived entirely for this film and i think is a much better ending than the original story and how some of the other versions play it out that that, that I, I don't think any of the, the versions have as satisfying of an ending as this original 1930 film adaptation of The Criminal Code. And that was something that Hawks and others recognized and really had to work at to try and uh, come up with a more satisfying conclusion that still kept the tone of the story, uh, but didn't... Uh, weren't as melodramatic admittedly because when you read how the original play ends and you see the other versions or you listen to the the way the radio drama dramatization ends it it's not as good it doesn't it doesn't work as well so i i think the the improvements made to the film along with the extremely strong visuals there there are moments that are um, burn themselves into your brain. In particular, uh, there's the great moment when Houston's character first becomes warden and every, everyone in the prison yard essentially starts yelling and hollering because most of them were put there by Houston's DA <laughs> character. So, uh, but he doesn't, uh, of course, it's Walter Houston. He's not going to take that line down. So he goes out the door and walks through the prison yard and, and they part like the sea parting and they all go dead quiet. That's a, it's a brilliant visual and you get a lot of classic prison imagery like the men being uh, worked to death or uh, in solitary confinement. But the other standout is of course uh, Boris Karloff's performance. He is in a smaller supporting role but the world weariness and sense of menace that he exudes is just, it leaps off the screen. So it makes perfect sense that this is where uh, the stories sort of differ, but essentially it was David Lewis, who was the partner of James Whale, who saw Karloff in this film. And it's like, this, this is 
this is the guy you need to go with for for Frankenstein because they couldn't find anybody. And uh, Karloff got the film because he had gotten to do the same role on the uh, on the stage when the when the play was done in Los Angeles just before uh, the the film was made. So that getting that part in the stage version in L.A. got him into the film version, and this is where he finally started to get more recognition outside of the constant endless hunt hundreds and thousands of little bit parts because he had an extraordinarily long career that most people don't realize that went far beyond uh, what immediately led up to Frankenstein in 1931. And you get that sense of menace. There are some bits that even make you think of his performance in Frankenstein, in particular the moment the film builds up to where uh, the the informer is being held in the warden's office and the Karloff character manages to to sneak his way in there while a riot is being staged to dra- to uh, distract attention and with no dialogue he comes in the room and you just see him from behind but you can see the outlines of his face and the way that he's 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 sort of hunched over the way that his whole body exudes violence <laughs> and suppressed rage uh, it, it's very uh, and then the fact that they sort of stalk each other around a desk it made me immediately flash to the the moments where uh, the the creature breaks into Elizabeth's bedroom in Frankenstein and they have the the, the sort of uh, <laughs> the dance around the bed and the dresser and things and and he's sort of following and chasing her around uh, so there's there's a little flash of that but there, there's there's a lot of, of uh, I guess you would say, Karloffisms already on display here. And he exudes such a sense of menace and of uh, just bitterness from, from being imprisoned all this time and be already being a hard man. Uh, it, it's a, a showpiece role for Karloff, even though it's a smaller part and a supporting part in the film. But this... This was the standout that really got him noticed, and this is really the film that got him Frankenstein because it set the ball in motion, essentially. So it's a uh, an absolutely essential title for horror fans, and uh, especially for Karloff fans. And that's why most of the time when you when you talk about the film or you read about it, most of the discussion is going to be around Karloff, and then you see the film and you're like, well, why? Because it's it's a it's a small supporting part. But it's because if, if, if it weren't for this film and this role, uh, we probably wouldn't have had Boris Karloff in Frankenstein, and he probably would not have become the Boris Karloff icon that we know and love. What's also remarkable about this film is it could have easily slipped into melodrama or into cliché, and it doesn't. It, it manages to find a nice balance between being a prison picture and being a social drama about the ills of society and being about the uh, being about the legal system and being a message picture and there is a, a romantic story there is a love story as every film had to have but it is dialed in nicely and nothing is ever forced or obvious so it, it's a film that really walks a tightrope and at any point could fall into going too far of one way and And so I think it really is one of the strongest, if not the strongest, uh, early talkie that is essentially a prison picture. Uh, There are a number of really striking examples, but this one manages to get across the intensity of the scenario and get you invested in the performances and particularly the Phillips Holmes lead character. Will he or won't he be destroyed, essentially? And you get fully invested in the story, and it is further enhanced by Hawks' direction the improvements to the original play made, particularly in the ending, uh, the strong lead performances of Holmes and Walter Houston, the showy part for Karloff, and the beautiful photography. There's also some really impressive sound design for an early talkie as well. Uh, again, when the, pri- the when the prisoners all get riotous and really loud, and then all of a sudden the sound stops. Uh, there's a great usage of silence. There's a great usage of the passage of time because this takes place over an extended period of the lead character's uh, time of um, incarceration 
incarceration. But I, again, I, I, revisiting it on this release, I, I, I just found myself struck at how well put together it was, and particularly for being a film from 1930, making it an early talkie. It's also a pre-code film, so it's allowed to be a bit more risque, delving into the darker elements of society. And you see this in the remakes of the film, which are obviously not pre-code and so they sort of tiptoe around this stuff or just eliminate it entirely so it's another reason why this is still the best version of the story even though it's been done three times not counting the lost spanish version of this film so it's it's a wonderful film to come back to i hadn't seen it since i saw it on dvd a number of years ago it doesn't get talked about very much but it is a key important film in both hawks's filmography and especially for karloff because again without this film in this role he wouldn't have mostly probably wouldn't have gotten Frankenstein and the whole history of horror films would have been altered completely so uh, it, it's it's a real gem it's incredibly well made and it's a perfect example of an extraordinarily well made and designed early talkie that's also a great pre-code film that you can show to people and use it as an example that early talkies could be great and they weren't all ruined by the advent of sound that they were still full of great bursts of creativity and they could also improve upon uh, their stage play basis now we come to indicators blu-ray their spine 207 with this beautiful very striking original poster artwork lovingly reproduced as are all indicator uh, jackets their typical spine. This is the limited edition uh, package with the uh, exclusive book, uh, as Indicator does. So once this sells out, it will be a standard version with the same art, but obviously minus the book. The reversible cover art has the same art as the label, so they have used one of the film's alternate posters that gives greater focus to Walter Houston. Then we come to Indicator's limited edition book. I say book, it's it's you know technically a booklet, but as usual, they do such an amazing job. I want to call them books. But we all know who the main draw of this film is. So good old Boris gets a beautiful publicity still to kick off the included book and in indicator's release. As always nobody does as as well as indicator does with these this is loaded with lovingly reproduced stills uh information about the film in addition to a wonderful new essay this essay is by philip kemp done for this new release and then uh, indicator always tries to have a vintage piece in here and this one is wonderful because it's a piece entitled the modernity of howard hawks by the great legend henry langlois uh, this was done in 1963, and he had a particular fascination for Hawks's early talkies. Uh, again, all of these Columbia films like The Criminal Code and 20th Century. And at the time, and still even today, they're not often talked about like other films of, of the era. And of course, they are overshadowed by Hawks's later masterpieces. <laughs> So it's really wonderful to see where that at least started to turn around a little bit. And, of course, you have one of the great, if not the most famous cinephile of all time, <laughs> writing a piece about it. And another fascinating bit, there is a piece of the vintage critical response to the film and the performances on display, which is always fascinating to be able to see. Then we have the credits with a shot of the one sheet. So to talk about the actual master and presentation, uh, the credit is Sony's HD remaster was the source of this indicator edition uh, the film's original mono soundtrack was remastered at the same time now that's all the detail it goes into but that means that this is from sony's uh, current hd master which dates back to when the dvd was made so it's not a full 4k restoration like 20th century got and then of course the booklet concludes with an onset still of hawks as indicator likes to get a shot of the director or producer at the time period on the back of their booklets. So to talk about the actual transfer, again, this is Sony's HD master. So it's basically a 1080p version of the same master that turned up on the limited DVD release the film has gotten. I do think it's an improvement over that. I did see that DVD release once. I've just never owned it because it's one of those uh, vault 
collection DVDs they did for TCM a long time ago. They're very expensive. Um, so it's not a brand new 4K restoration, obviously. Uh, it is a little bit limited in that respect due to the elements they had. It's obviously the best elements they had to use, but you will notice that the opening, particularly the, the opening 10 minutes or so, are rather soft looking. Uh, of course, do keep in mind the film was shot by two different cinematographers, so there will be some difference, although it's they're, they're actually quite close. It's hard to sit there and play, oh, who shot what? But do keep that factor in mind. Uh, there is some damage in the element, unfortunately. You will notice the occasional spec. The specs are actually quite rare, but there is an occasional line or two. There is a tiny bit of frame wobble towards the opening, but the, the, the real thing you'll notice is there are, I'd say at least two or three very small moments where there is seemingly a frame missing, uh, causing a very, very tiny little jump. But those are thankfully minor and they are part of the source itself unless somehow a print is found that has those missing frames intact but again it's it's literally one frame that's missing I, I stopped and, and checked when I saw one of those and it's 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 so minute that most people are probably not going to notice it but for a Columbia film from 1930 yeah, the elements are going to be what they are and a lot of that stuff is going to be baked in so Sony has done really great work for a number of decades now and trying to preserve the classic Columbia library. This is just a title where it, it is pretty much an as-is presentation in terms of this was the best they could do in restoring the film for its HD master, but it is not a brand new 4K scan and brand new 4K restoration. So do keep that in mind. It is what it is, and it is a beautiful presentation on this indicator release and with a maxed out encoding, as indicator always does, and it is the best video release the film has ever gotten. It does advance over the old DVD presentation with which was standard def, and as with most Sony HD masters, even if they're older, they do gain quite a bit by making the jump to a beautifully encoded Blu-ray release. Now, the audio is also similar in that it does have some intrinsic noise, Some in, 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 it definitely sounds like a 1930 audio track, so do keep that in mind. This is still an early talkie from 1930, so it, it's going to have baked-in defects. Uh, the audio is presented in PCM mono, as indicated likes to do. Uh, so it's fully lossless and it sounds excellent for what it is. Uh, but again, this this is Sony's HD master still, so it has not gotten a brand new modern 4K scan and restoration. So again, this is easily the best video release the film has gotten, and it hasn't gotten too terribly many video releases over the years. I, I think it, I think it got a VHS release, and then it eventually got that uh, that limited DVD reissue, and now we have the Indicator release. And the Indicator is actually the first uh, Blu-ray appearance of this film anywhere, so it's the world premiere of the film on Blu-ray. So moving on to the extras, this is quite stuffed because it is a very important film for many different reasons and of course you have the Karloff connection as well. So the extras package includes a new piece entitled Behind the Mask which runs 26 minutes where we have the great and always fascinating Kim Newman talking about this film, its place in Karloff's career, Karloff's career before and after this point point. And as usual, you just want it to keep going because it's Kim Newman talking about Karloff and classic films and you're peering behind him to see what books he's got on the shelf as always. And it's it's almost a half hour long, absolutely indispensable. Uh, he has a fantastic talent for going into greater detail about classic films and horror stars and making it warm and fascinating to listen to at the same time. So if he's ever anywhere, you have to listen to what he has to say. It's it's always a, a, a complete joy uh, watching or listening to any Kim Newman piece on a video release. Then there is a new 30-minute video essay entitled Codes and Convictions, where Jonathan Bygraves talks about the different adaptations of the film, including actual clips from the other versions. Uh, this is a must-watch piece. It's fascinating, even if you're not concerned about the other versions of the film, and it will definitely enrich 
your opinions of this version. Uh, it, it, this is the type of nitty gritty nerdiness that I love to do myself. Uh, I think it's fascinating to compare different versions of the same story, even if on the surface they are rather similar. And there is quite a bit of the, the final version that is in the uh, Columbia Noir Volume 3. So, of course, there's a great plug for another indicator release. If you're new to Howard Hawks, or newer to Howard Hawks, I should say, there's a great piece from an old uh, BFI event where uh, it's entitled A Masterclass on Hawks with John Carpenter, who is one of the most famous Howard Hawks fans and devotees. So he basically talks for 36 minutes about uh, the influence Hawks has had on his career and some general forma- information about Hawks in, in a sort of uh, a live theater sc- uh, screening after screening some Hawks films. So not not necessarily any information that a Hawks fan uh, might not already know, but it's fascinating to hear uh, the influence on Hawks uh, from Carpenter directly himself. So and also talking about what he gets from various uh, classics of Hawks's filmography. And again, it's a nice little lengthy piece that runs about 36 minutes, but it is audio only because it's a recording of a live event. We also get the Lux Radio Theater version of the play. So it's a radio adaptation condensing the film down, but it stars Edward G. Robinson instead of Walter Houston. So you get to visualize, or at least in your mind's eye, uh, how Eddie G. Robinson would approach the Walter Houston role. And he does play it slightly differently. There's a different sort of energy, and it's fun to compare and contrast the two. But even greater is what they do to the film's ending, which is changed quite a bit and uh, is a different sort of reworking of the original ending of the story. And it does show a distinct difference from the from the Hawks film ending. So it's another sort of reading on how this story could end compared to the original story source and all the different film versions. So it's one of those radio plays uh, that even though it is, you know, Lux Radio Theater, which typically would do uh, adaptations pretty close to the original films, it's one of those where there are so many differences particularly the ending and the way it's handled, and you get to hear uh, Eddie G. Robinson doing the Walter Houston role, that I think it is really rewarding, and if you're already looking at the other film adaptations, I think you have to look at the radio adaptation as well, because it has its own distinct rendering of the story's ending. Additionally, we get another wonderful indicator image gallery, which is loaded with high-quality stills, and most importantly, there are a great number of stills from the lost Spanish-language version of the film, so... uh, uh, the information about the, the 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 film is is unfortunately rather scarce, but that combined with the surviving images really gives you an idea of maybe what this film could be like. And not only is it was it made in the same manner as the Spanish Dracula in terms of using the same sets at night and trying to match or uh, differentiate between what Hawks would shoot during the day, but it also has some of the same cast members. You even have Carlos Villarreal, who played Dracula in the Spanish Dracula, appearing in the Spanish version of The Criminal Code. So it's fascinating to have some surviving images included from that version. Then it goes on to list that the English subtitles are new and improved for this release. The limited edition 30 six page booklet with the new essay the fact that this is a world premiere on blu-ray and limited to 3,000 copies however i saved the absolute best for last because this release contains an audio commentary brand new for this release by nora fiore also known as the nitrate diva on uh, various online social media platforms and her blog which i have read before in the past but uh, this is the first time i've heard one of her actual commentaries she's done a handful uh for uh, actually a couple for indicator releases now I have to say this is the absolute best commentary I've heard in years. Uh, it is extraordinarily well put together uh, with a that shows a great deal of research and also discussing the cast and crew, where it places in their filmography. She talks about why James Wong Howe was unfortunately replaced in the making of this film. She talks about the other versions of the film. She talks about the original stage play source and the development and reworking of the film's ending, the importance of this film for Karloff's career, where it places in Hawks's early filmography, and 
it's just a blast to listen to because she manages to instill a great deal of energy and most importantly, a great deal of humor throughout. And that is the key, at least for me, of making a commentary fun to listen to and rewarding. That's what separates the great commentaries that you listen to every time you rewatch the film uh, as a sort of ritual because you've rewatched the film, you've got to re-listen to the commentary. Uh, that's what separates those from even the really good scholarly tracks where they're they're a bit drier and especially from the really boring commentaries that are just kind of a waste of time so it is wonderful when you get one of these where you can tell the person is really invested and has done the research and has managed to find a way to cram all this in into the commentary while also referencing things that are going on so you're not just getting like somebody reading their own written essay. Uh, the commentaries are a really difficult art, and I'm a commentary geek. I listen to every commentary on every disc because I, I love the format, and I'm actually such a nerd that I rip them and listen to them while I'm driving. I don't listen to podcasts. I listen to audio commentaries. And when I started doing my own, I discovered just how much of a Herculean task it is to to pull it off and make it still a fun listen and get all the information in there and try to keep up with the film as it's playing. And you, you have to have like 20 different sections of your brain going at the same time. Uh, you can write an essay beforehand and just read your, you know, read your commentary. But that doesn't really play with watching a film, whether you watch the commentary with the film or you do like I do and just listen to it separately after watching the film. So I, I, I don't say this lightly when, when I say this is the best commentary I've heard in years. There have been many great commentaries over the past few years. This is the one that really I found the most engaging. It, you know, there, there are even some great jokes worked in. And from the introduction alone, you know this is going to be a fun and truly informative commentary. So uh, I can't praise this track highly enough. It is easily the best extra of a already fantastic extras package from Indicator. And to be completely honest, the commentary is worth purchasing the disc for. It's that good. Again, I, I don't say this lightly. I've listened to hundreds of commentaries in, in, in the, just in the past year, actually, because, uh, again, I, I, I rip my own commentaries to, uh, to digital sources, and I just put them on my MP3 player, and I listen to them as I drive in my car, because, uh, you know, what, what's a, a film geek going to do? So I, I'm not just saying it to say it, but... Uh, uh, Nora Fiore's commentary on the criminal code for this indicator release is the best commentary I've heard in years. Uh, it is a must listen. It's a masterclass on the film, Hawks, Karloff, early talkies, prison and crime films of the early talkies, uh, the adaptations of this story and its production in terms of how this film was produced, and even talking about the lost Spanish language version. Uh, just an absolute treasure of a commentary track, and uh, it's kind of what, how I figured it would be, because I've, I've seen uh, some of the Nitrate Divas posts on Twitter and, and some of her blog posts over the years, so uh, you know, I, I knew it would, would have uh, you know, a great deal of research and, and some humor worked in, but I did not expect just how wonderful of a listening experience it was. So I can't wait to hear some of her other commentary tracks, and especially uh, she just did one for their uh, Indicator's new Columbia Noir Volume 5 Bogart set on one of my favorite later Bogart films, Tokyo Joe. So um, again, an absolute treasure of a commentary track, the highlight of a fantastic extras package, and again, not only is the film a classic and this beautiful indicator release uh, is, is a must own and the best release the film has ever had, but the commentary is so good and goes into so much detail that I have, I, I, including a lot of stuff that I did not know uh, and I had actually always wondered about. Uh, it's worth purchasing this disc simply for the audio commentary. It is that good. It's one of the best commentaries I've ever heard. So that's Indicator's release of the 1930 Howard Hawks classic, The Criminal Code. And even though it's not from a brand new 4K restoration and it's an older Sony HD master, this is easily the best presentation the film has ever gotten. It is a absolutely stuffed to the gills Indicator release in terms of the extras, the limited edition booklet, the beautiful packaging that uh, displays that even 
on a title that does not have a new 4K restoration. Indicator does not skimp, and they really do the best job of anyone in the world in terms of disc releases as a, uh, as a release label. The attention to quality and detail is across the board excellent from the packaging, the artwork, the beautiful simplicity of their releases, the incredible booklets, the fantastic supplemental features, and the always excellent and I think best in the business, disc encoding, where even if it's an, a, a Studio HD master like this from Sony, it is still beautifully encoded at a maxed out bit rate. So this is another absolutely essential indicator title. It is the limited edition version to 3,000 copies, and once this is completely sold out, they will transition over into their standard edition, which has the same art and same disc, same wonderful extras, but you will lose the wonderful booklet. So it's always a better idea to get their limited editions if it's a title you're really invested in uh, or a great fan of before they disappear. So that's Indicator's Spine 207 release of The Criminal Code, one of the great early talkie classics, one of the still one of the classic prison crime films, uh, and easily the best presentation it's ever gotten. It's another essential must-own indicator release who are my favorite label. So again, I am an indicator fanboy, and I proudly admit it because uh, every release that they do, uh, you get it in your hands and you can just feel the attention to detail and the quality and the extreme care that Indicator puts into every release that they do, even if it's an old Sony HD master like this. They really tried their darndest here, as they do with every release. So I, I cannot recommend this release highly enough. I hope this has convinced you. Uh, if, if, if it hasn't, I, I have not done my job because this is just a, another must-own incredible indicator release he defied the criminal code and paid she defied the moral code and suffered in the criminal code so that's my review of indicators beautiful release of the howard hawks classic the criminal code i hope this has been at least fun and somewhat informative uh, to listen to me once again babble on about films uh, and classic films and disc geekery but this is just how my head works, and uh, anytime I can get an indicator release, I, I'm just so pleased to praise it to the heavens when it deserves it, which they always do. That's why they're my absolute favorite label. Uh, they, they do incredible work, and even though you do have to import them and you do have to be region-free for most of their releases— Indicator titles are worth having a region-free player for because they are that incredible. Uh, they are now doing some releases here in the U.S., so that's uh, fantastic, and it's great that we finally can get some Indicator titles and some U.S. exclusives here, uh, and they've, all, they've always got great stuff planned, so I'm, I'm happy to see them getting greater success and a bigger foothold here in America. But until then, uh, their, their, their site sales are, are always helpful to pick up more titles, and uh, this is another of their beautiful limited editions. So always I'd like to say, keep supporting your studio labels and boutique labels to keep physical media alive, keep your disc spinning, and thanks ever so much for watching.